Ah, the best lay plans of mice and men. Well, the same rule applies for me. <laughs> this is an ongoing series, part four of which I did a couple of months ago, and for some reason I've let it go dormant for a while. Well, we're back with a vengeance now with part five. Now, this is a series that does require you to listen to the, each episode in order, so if you're new to this, please look at the uh, video description, because I've put a link to the uh, playlist for every episode of this one, and it will be well worth your time, I guarantee it. So, on to episode 5, and our protagonist is in need of an emergency evacuation, because things are about to go bad big time. Well, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Another aside about cliffhangers. As an author, they can be very exciting. I'm sorry to do that to you, because as a reader myself, I know how it feels. The anticipation, the build-up, the feeling of exhilaration, but disappointment at the same time. I always say aloud, as if the author could hear me, You son of a... Well, I hope that you, my dear readers, don't hate me for it. But at the same time, I hope the cliffhangers are working, getting you excited. And now they give me a kick. The blood covering the floor of the helicopter was spreading. There was a lot of blood. It was a miracle that he was still alive at that point. I honestly don't know to this day how he made it through that helicopter ride, but the medics kept working on him, and his eyes stayed open, focused on me. Yet, I felt nothing. I felt a distinct lack of feeling. Numbness. I could feel them below the surface. The guilt, the pain, the anger at myself. My eyelids felt heavy. All I wanted to do was close my eyes. But I felt that maybe by meeting his gaze there, I could keep him alive. And then, she appeared again, standing before me. No one else could see her, I think. Nobody looked or paid attention as she stepped closer. Her hands reached out. And I saw Gabe's eyes close through her body as she took hold of my head, falling down to her knees, and pushed my head into her chest. I felt her. She was real. I felt the soft, warm embrace of her body, and I closed my eyes. To say I could see the darkness would be a misnomer, because you cannot see darkness. I could see nothing. I was not real. I had no body. The only thing I was experiencing was her. Her voice. At first it was distant, but it grew closer every moment. She spoke to me. You suffer. You should not. You have both been through too much to let something like this take us down. You have to get up. You have to keep going. Only you can make that decision. Only you can control your destiny. Stand, John. Rise and face the music. In my head, my body materialized in front of my eyes. I was face down in the dirt. I tilted my head up, out of the fill. My arms moved out from my side and slammed into the ground, pushing me up and out with a gritty, grainy sound. My hands balled into fists. In my mind, only one thought dared to rise above the others. And as soon as I recognized it, I grabbed a hold of it and shouted it for all of this imaginary world to hear. I will not let him die. I snapped back into the real world, and in front of me sat Gabe, eyes closed. He was still breathing, but he was fading fast. I crawled through the blood on the metal floor, then used my hand to slap his face, and screamed into his ear, Wake up! I swear to all that is holy, Gabe. If you die here, I'll kill you myself. Think of your wife. Think of your kids. They need you to stay alive. By now, we were close to the base, and below us I could feel the force of the explosions. I looked out at the back of the helicopter, and saw the scarred ground we'd left behind. Inhabiting it were hundreds of the things we'd faced in the forest, all manner of animals, all slowly marching towards the base. They were being held back, but just barely. In front of me, Gabe's eyes flickered open. I frantically said to him, Gabe, stay with me, man. Just stay with me. The bandit on his legs were red with blood. My hands and legs were covered in it. 
the helicopter was so low that if you reached out, you might touch a tree as it went by. Finally, the helicopter flared, revealing an even more intense battlefield behind us. It was filled with armoured vehicles. Everything from armoured fighting vehicles like the BMPT Terminator, a tank modified with faster firing guns and missile launchers to fight in cities, to infantry carriers like the BTR-90, all firing near constantly into the horde. The rounds they fired seemed to be whatever they could get their hands on, and all of the launch tubes for their missiles were empty. Next to them, dismounted infantry fired their rifles nearly blindly into the mass of grey and blue explosions. They too looked as if they were using anything they could. SVDs, AKs and RPGs of all makes and models filled their hands, no matter its date of manufacture. Older AK-47s firing the heavier but slower 7.62mm round, and brand new AK-15s firing their 5.45mm round were side by side. Early Cold War era reusable RPG-7s were fired continuously next to piles of modern disposable tube launches like the RPG-18. Farther away, snipers and machine gunners utilised their weapons, everything from the mainline belt-fed PKM to older RPDs, their drum magazine belt holders apparent. The helicopter finally flared, within visual range of the battle line, and below us the base came into view through the rear ramp. It was a shambles. Supply lines led to the walls, with vehicles ferrying ammo, fuel and troops to and from the front lines. The airbase had several crashed and destroyed airplanes littering it, making large portions of it unusable. Only one runway remained operational. I can only guess as to the reason those planes had been destroyed. But none of my guesses were any good for the future. Images of bears awkwardly holding shoulder-fired anti-air missiles fill my mind, right alongside the more horrifying thought of swarms of angry birds coming down on them as they took off. The helicopter hit the ground with a thud, and the medical team that had been patiently waiting strode over to the heli through the mostly clean rotor wash. The gurney was wheeled into the helicopter, but before he was moved onto it and out of the helicopter, whose engines were still running at full speed, I looked him in the eyes and shouted at him as he closed them, Don't you die, or else Deborah will have both our asses. His eyes snapped back open, and what I saw in them was enough determination to give me the confidence that he would not die. Not if he had any say in the matter. See, among mili military personnel, Death is something that can be beaten. Not a silly, false optimism, but something that is simply another fight in their lives. Some people have the determination to fight death, despite it being in its arms, to give it such a harsh resistance that it will not come to you. A former Navy SEAL wrote an amazing book that I refrain from naming here due to copyright reasons, although I can tell you that this particular book was written about Operation Red Wing, although there is some controversy over the exact details. There was incredible resilience shown by all of the men during that operation. I hesitate to liken Gabe's struggle to theirs, however. However, he was certainly on the brink of death, and he was definitely fighting for his life and winning. As they wheeled the gurney into a UAZ-3152, a military ambulance that resembles a fully covered Willys Jeep, but fire engine red, the vehicle turned and sped down the runway, straight towards the base hospital. The crew chief of the helicopter hurried us out. The reason for this was evident as the helicopter lifted off again, making a turn towards the battlefield as it climbed into the sky, leaving us standing alone in the road to wash, and soon just alone. We stood on the helipad for a few moments before anyone said anything. Then, slowly, one by one, all of the Russians started walking to me. Petrenko grabbed my shoulder, standing in front of me. I have seen worse before, and with his spirit, I have no doubt he'll make it. But you, friend, you have some problems. I worry about you. Take a break. I interrupted him, and although I did not want to be rude towards him, my voice certainly must have betrayed my anger. I kindly refuse. I may have personal problems, but it's obvious to me that you need every man you can get. It's also obvious to me that, from the lack of transport aircraft here, that you do not intend on running away. 
This leaves me with two options. I can call my superiors and leave, or stay here, fight, and hopefully survive. He, uh, thankfully was not offended. Although, at the mention of escape, he looked longingly at the runway, with all of the debris covering it. Unfortunately, even if command would let us evac, we have nothing that could stick a landing on these runways, and even if we had a dozer to get all of it off, that would mean pulling a tank off the front lines. He then looked at me, telling me, Option two, it is then. We cannot escape. We must fight. I stared into his eyes for a moment, judging his resolve. In my head I asked, Does he care enough about his men to run? Or is hubris his flaw? I asked him one final question. Lieutenant, what do you want to do? Outside of your command, outside of your orders, what do you want to do? He stood for a moment, then looked up as if considering the consequences of stating his own opinion aloud. Then he looked left and right, checking to make sure that nobody but his men, who had formed a rough, wide chevron behind him, were listening. I want to get the hell out of here. We are low on ammo, rations and morale. We need to get the hell out, or we will die here, and our families will never know what happened to us. His man nodded in agreement behind him. Then, without a moment of thought, I responded. Lieutenant, take me to the general. I have an idea, and some friends back in Kandahar who would very much like to see their operatives, or at least what remains, come home safe, and... Well, I'm sure they wouldn't mind giving you a ride home, either. At first he looked unsure. He was uneasy with the suggestion I was making. However, he was very well aware of his country's tendency to make people and events disappear. He appeared to have made up his mind, and motioned for me to follow him. We made the short trek across the base, carrying our full battle arrangement, bloody and sweaty. As we passed the barracks, some soldiers who were just getting off of their rest cycle stepped out, and seeing us, their jaws dropped. One of them pointed to us, then slapped his teammate on the shoulder, saying in Russian, It's Petrenko's squad. They stared at us as we passed them, only stopping when we rounded a corner, the command post coming into view. I looked at Petrenko, who was jogging along at my side. You know, it's almost like you're famous or something. He laughed, as best he could through his straining breath, and then said, panting in between every few words, We may have done a little work with a few Spetsnaz units before we transferred to MCHS. I contemplated this as we slowed our jog close to the door to the command tent. Of course, to be part of MCHS Spetsnaz, they would first have to be Spetsnaz for another branch of the Russian military. Probably Autriad Mobilnie Osobo Nazechnia, OMON, Special Purpose Mobile Unit, or another Special Forces Unit under the Ministerio Vonetrik Del, MDV, Ministry of Internal Affairs. Maybe even part of the Voroshno Destanie Voiska, VDV, Russian Airborne Troops. Wouldn't surprise me, given the astounding amount of mobility between the services in their military. And, although it would be easier for me to simply say those acronyms, I feel it's important to show people why they are what they are, especially for those that have never seen them before, and those that do not understand Russian. Petrenko motioned for his squad to wait outside, with his second-in-command making an informal salute, and a bunch of them squatting, heels down in a small group. We walked into the tent, a door little more than a plastic-framed excuse for an entryway. Inside, the tent opened up into an operations centre, full of screens, men seated in front of them, as well as many radios, all packed as tightly as possible against the walls. The duty officer nearly had a heart attack when he saw our filthy uniforms, covered in blood and our boots, muddy from the jog over. However, despite the fact this man, a major, well outranked him, Petrenko told him casually to Jacques and to point us to the general. Although he looked down his nose at us for the filth we brought into his tent, his respect for Petrenko outweighed this, even if only by a little bit. The major shook his head, then motioned across his chest while turning away from us, 
towards a radio operator making a report back to him. He listened to the report, then turned to us as we passed and said, on an unrelated note, The Major General is on the phone with Butchkov right now. Petrenko nodded, then proceeded to waltz through the busy op centre, with me right behind him, avoiding the many moving parts of what was, for the large part, keeping this base alive. We reached the door, and from the inside I could hear the infuriated roaring of Smirnov over the din of the op centre. Through the flexible plastic window, we saw him marching around his desk, damn near screaming into the receiver of his desk phone. He fired off one last parting shot at the man on the other side, saying something along the lines of, get fucked, before slamming the receiver down onto the holder and throwing the whole assembly at the tent wall, where it fell, somewhat disappointingly, harmlessly against the floor. I looked at Petrenko, who was, although a little startled, not surprised. Must be a normal occurrence then. As Petrenko and I stepped through the door, in my head I heard a distant female voice tell me, as if through a veil of mist and fog, Hurry! Although I was already alert, given the enraged state of Smirnov, this made me awake. Although I did not expect her to speak constantly, I did expect her to speak. However, she'd been remarkably silent following the events in the helicopter. My mind snapped back into the situation at hand as Petrenko opened the door. The general had collapsed into his chair. His head was in his hands. Clearly he had been defeated. He turned, looking through his fingers at us. We stood together, both covered in blood, uniforms wet from the snow and mine filthy from the mud. He turned back into his hands and said in English, Americansky, do you have a family? I looked at the floor, at my boots, then back up to the desk and the general. I slowly opened my lips, speaking, or not very unsure, as I had no idea if I really did or not. Well, I can't really answer that honestly, for a variety of reasons, but let's assume I do. He sighed heavily and asked, Then you, I would assume, would do anything to get back to them. I responded quickly this time, no hesitation, pride rising in my voice. Of course, my family, if I theoretically had one, would matter more to me than anything. He took a deep breath, then removed his face from his hands. It was wet, cheeks stained with tears, eyes red. He spoke in the most defeated tone I have ever known, in any man or otherwise. In twelve, no, eleven hours. A nuclear warhead will detonate over this area, specifically to destroy the Medvedi Molni surrounding us. There are no plans to evacuate us, and even if there were, they are using us as bait. His eyes fell to the floor. He gave myself no time to process this information. I needed to make a phone call, now more urgently than ever before. Petrenko concertedly spoke up, stating, But General, we have vehicles. I am sure that if we made a break for it, we would have some chance at surviving. Smirnov responded through his hidden tears. Even if the five hundred of us left could muster the strength to break out, we would waste all of our remaining fuel on the armor necessary for such an action. Beside me, Petrenko fell to his knees, silent. He was staring blankly at the floor of the tent, which stared right back at him with the same intensity. He whispered slowly, and barely audibly, Lena. I practically dived for the phone, snatching the handset off of the ground, and damn near frantically punching numbers into the keypad. I pressed the handset to my ear. It rang for not even a second before it was picked up on the other end, its holder saying only one commanding word. Speak. I was all too happy to oblige. We have a triple zero. I repeat, triple zero. We need immediate extract from our current location. On the other end, the voice seemed to be a little confused. Are you sure? We have a link to you. But I cut him off before he could finish. Just shut the hell up and get Bob on the phone. The operator seemed to pause for a moment, saying faintly over the line, 
Fair enough. Then more clearly, he's currently on holiday. We aren't allowed to contact him by comp... Yet again I cut him off, but this time by hanging up the phone. I then punched in another set of numbers, determined. I said to myself, asshole. As the phone rang and rang and rang. Finally, the ringing stopped. The voice on the other end was quite angry at his vacation having been interrupted. Bob's normally jovial and happy voice was downright pissed. Oh, this better be good. I was about to enjoy some nice cool Caribbean. Yet again, they were interrupted. Triple zero, Bob. I need one, no, two things. San Antonio and Patriot. The runaways here are all kinds of fucked, and they're the only ones with AMP. His voice went silent, and his anger was quelled. Over the phone, I heard him taking in a deep breath and exhaling forcefully. Then he spoke to me, words measured but confident. It will be arranged. I assume the Russians have decided to fuck themselves. I responded quickly. Yep, thanks again, Bob. I'll call back in a jiffy. I slapped the receiver back into its cradle and spoke to the two men in the room with me who seemed to have lost hope. Although they'd heard my end of the conversation, neither of them understood or cared enough to understand. They were both very well in their own minds. That was understandable. Who would not fall to their knees and weep at the thought of their families left alone, their wives forced to remarry, and their deaths covered up as an unfortunate nuclear accident. I said, addressing them both, my comrades, I believe I have a way for you to see your families again. Their heads slowly rose. Their eyes were both red, and their cheeks stained with tears from the moment of weakness that they both suffered. Men do cry. It's just something we all like to avoid talking about afterwards. After all, we're supposed to be the stoic ones, and if we can't see ourselves like that, how can anyone else? To me... The situation we just found ourselves in was just another problem. The reason I had not fallen with the other two was that I just happened to have the solution. I promise you, I have emotions too. You'll just have to trust me on that. But enough about that. Back to the situation at hand. The Russians had a transportation problem. Well, really more of a caring about their men problem. But that's nothing I personally can help with. However... I did have transportation. Apparently, this base, with all of the evacuations that had occurred before we arrived back, now contained about 500 men, including the wounded. Easy carrying for the two planes I'd requisitioned. 200 or so on the lower deck, plus about 100 on the top decks. One plane would carry every combat-capable soldier in the base, minus a few medical personnel, this plane would be loaded with parachute equipment so that all of these troops could be airdropped once we figured out where the hell we had to go next. The other airplane would carry all of the wounded to a secure location for medical assistance. They both were appreciative of the plan. Appreciative in the sense that they understood it, were thankful and were willing to follow it, but also that they understood the ramifications of such an undertaking. It would be viewed by the bureaucracy as not just an act of insubordination, but a mutiny. Collaboration with us, who are a foreign power in our own right, would likely taint their careers to the point of no return. After hearing my explanation, they sat there for a moment. They had earlier wiped the tears from their cheeks and been listening intently. Smirnov broke the silence, speaking to me. I appreciate this plan. However, there is there is no way they will reach us in time. Even if they were TU 144s and could reach us in time, with the runways in the state they are in. But I interrupted him. You may have noticed that I have a bit of a tendency to do this, and I'm aware of it, existentially so. It's both a habit and an intentional action. I don't have time to waste on words that needn't be said. In a normal military hierarchy, this may have gotten me reprimanded, and even as a contractor we are expected to follow the hierarchy to a certain degree. However, in this conversation, under the pressure of nuclear annihilation, all of us were equals. I confidently assured him, oh, Don't you worry, 
They will be here in time, and they will be able to land. Just trust me on this, Major General Smirnov. He slammed his fist in the desk, saying, They had damn well better be here. He was back to his usual self. That was good. Petrenko noticed this and faintly smiled for the first time since I'd seen him in the truck before we headed into the village. I smiled too. The general then asked me, Exactly how far away is that? I shot back at him. Depends on your answer to this next question. He looked like he knew this was coming and straightened up in his seat in preparation. I asked him, Where's Casimir? He took a deep breath, then forcefully exhaled, saying, Well, I am not really supposed to tell you that. And you know, it's not really a problem most of the time when people have to withhold information. But we had very little time before Baba Yaga's three days were going to run out. I damn sure didn't want a witch going medieval on me, in addition to the entire thing with the bears. So, I will admit, I was a bit irritated. I slammed both of my fists down on the desk and leaned over to him. This scared even the formidable general. If you don't, we're all going to die, painfully, along with your families. Baba Yaga is angry, and it's only by our intervention that you are all not piles of jelly on that goddamn runway. So, tell me where the kid is. He took a deep breath and cursed lowly as he exhaled. Fine, but you did not hear it from me. Those bukes over at R&D will have my head if they find out I told someone about their little pet project. He took a deep breath and then told me. The boy is in Chernobyl. This gave me some pause. Although I was expecting to have to travel a little bit, I was not expecting that. However, there was really nothing we could do about it. Chernobyl, the site of the infamous nuclear disaster that killed and maimed many people, was now a secret research facility under control of the Russian government. The site of the nuclear power plant, NPP, and the nearby town of Pripyat were controlled as tourist locations by the Ukrainian Tourism Ministry. However, the Russians control much of the surrounding area, as well as the radiological preserve across the border in Belarus. Of course, he didn't hear any of that from me, because, of course, it's all a secret. I had one last phone call to make. Bob? Yeah, I'm here. What's their ETA? About two hours. They'll be over Krasnyarsk with Waypoint 1, and 2 will take them just about 30 miles out from you. Alrighty. Which one is hot? San Antonio. I hope you know what you're doing out there. This whole thing is making the command center a little anxious. I was well aware of this fact. I know it makes the staff all antsy whenever someone disrespects their authority. But they took too much time to do things with their <laughs> proper authorization. REMFs. Trust me. When this is all over, I think it'll be worth it. If you say so. When they're out of Waypoint 2, they'll start calling over the emergency freaks. So make sure the ATC is listening. Will do, Bob. Thanks again. Believe me, it won't be the first or the last time that you do this. I know I did plenty of times back in the day. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd better get on this. See ya. See ya. I set the phone down on its pedestal, which thankfully now was on Smirnov's desk. Gentlemen, I have the plan to get us out, but we also need a plan to get on the plane safely. They'll be here in about two hours, which means that we're going to have to start falling back soon. Clear both of the runways of men and equipment, and get whatever fuel you have together. The general nodded. We will do this. Petrenko perked up, seemingly having an idea. A good idea. General, do we have mines? He looked at Petrenko, almost insulted. What kind of question is that? Of course we have minds. I smiled at Petrenko. Good man, I thought. Then the planning began in earnest. 
Some section officers were called in and told of the recent developments. They seemed shocked that they were going to be nuked, but the fact that they were being saved in less than two hours was enough to keep them from going over the edge. They were all ordered to pull back their troops. Petrenko took the task of rallying the walking wounded to help place mines, and another lieutenant was given the task of rounding up the remaining AAA to form a cohesive air defence, something that they'd given up on after they lost all of their planes. Once they'd all been dispatched with their orders, I was left alone with the general. We sat there for a moment, in silence, but he soon spoke to me. You know, these days it's considered bad form to call people comrades, on account of the Soviet Union. However, they miss the true meaning of the word. Once, the humble worker and the powerful party secretary were supposed to be comrades, but the secretary looked down on them like the czars before him. There were few true comrades in the Soviet Union. However, I am proud to call you my comrade, because it seems that you give a damn about me and my men, something I cannot say about my superiors. The speech had made me feel good, in a way, but I suppressed the pride. It's just what we do, nothing more, nothing less, I told him. Then, all at once, a wave of nausea hit me. Gabe! The general looked at me, confused. Comrade, are you all right? My face was contorted into an agonized expression of guilt and anguish. I spoke in measured tones through the tightness in my chest just as a shaking started in my hands. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm just tired. Can you get someone to show me my fellow operative? The general's concern filled his face now. Yes, of course. Anything for you, comrade. He trailed off as he tried to place my name, then asked me, What is your name? Oh, although I wasn't supposed to. These circumstances were somewhat extenuating, so I caved. John. John Solomon. He smiled as best he could, and then said, Ah, Comrade Vanya, it is then, before stepping out and yelling for someone to escort me to the base hospital. A young, springy Russian came through the door, ready to go. I followed him out through the command centre, again dancing around the many people inside. The march over was uneventful. Finally, we arrived, and the young one handed me off to a grisly-looking man, a huge guy named Dimitri. He turned out to be a lot more gentle than his appearance would have suggested. Dimitri ducked through the doorways as he led me to Gabe's bed, packed in among a group of similarly wounded soldiers, where he lay unconscious in a medically induced coma. He'd lost so much blood that he was barely holding on, and the damage to his legs was so catastrophic that, that without the help of our organization's special medical services, it was likely he would take years to recover. My own state, however, was not much better. The effects of whatever the Rusalka had done to us were wearing off, and my eyes were beginning to close. Surprisingly, Dimitri noticed this. He put a hand on my shoulder and whispered into my ear, in Russian, or take a nap, dude. You've earned it. So, Right there, right then, I closed my eyes and passed out. So yeah, sorry about the massive delay in getting episode 5 to you, um, don't really know what happened. This is going to be a 10 part all in all, and I will make uh, more of an effort to get the episodes out quicker from now on. Not really sure what happened at all. Why have I left it so long? I don't know. Well, my dear friends, um, that's definitely enough for me for tonight, but I will be back again very soon with another long, long story for you on Monday. You'll join me, won't you? Go on, say you will. Of course you will. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?